Among the many things we know about nuclear weapons, two features will be our focus today. The first is the spectacular level of injury that nuclear weapons can inflict on the Earth and its inhabitants, human, animal, plants, and on our ground and sky. Recent work on nuclear winter concludes that if even a tiny fraction of our worldwide arsenal is used, not 1%, but 3 one-hundredths of 1%, 20 million people will die on the first afternoon, and 1 billion people will die in the first month. It's for this reason that the International Committee of the Red Cross has said that if even a single city is hit, their worldwide resources cannot accommodate and repair and help people. And every study that's done concludes the same thing. For example, a recent study of Netherlands that took the example of an even smaller percentage of the worldwide arsenal by a factor of 100, so three ten thousandths of 1% of the current arsenal. And they concluded that after a lot of the deaths, uh, since the center of the explosion would be uh, several times the temperature of the sun, there would be 10,000 people who survived but badly needed burn beds. And yet in all of the Netherlands, there aren't 10,000 burn beds, there are 100. And if that seems shockingly uncivilized to you, realize that Mass General has seven burn beds. An example of the huge discrepancy between the level of injury and, the, uh, and, and the, uh, our ability to repair it. One more example, some of you have probably read in a bulletin of atomic scientists, the account by Lynn Eden and Ted Postal of what would happen if an 800 kiloton bomb was detonated over um, Manhattan, and Russia does have seven, at least 700 of these, so it's not an improbable scenario. And the, uh, the, the, again, the temperature at the center is an ungodly multiple of the temperature of the sun. And within tens of minutes, the firestorm would spread to uh, between 90 and 150 square miles uh, of, of land. So only injuries that haven't yet happened can be repaired by being prevented. After it happens, it's too late to be indignant or to be sorry. It can only be repaired now. Um, and our, our first feature then that we're going to be attentive to is the uh, unconscionable level of injury. But even more central to the discussion today is the uh, second feature, and that is that this unthinkable level of injury resides in the hands of a solitary person. Resides in the hands of a solitary person. <coughs> or, in other countries, a small handful of people. Um, and, uh, and, and something that is more like 3 or 12, and in no way uh, compatible with uh, ordinary conceptions of governance. So the key features are, on one hand, this unthinkably magnified level of injury at one end of the weapon, and on the other end of the weapon, this unthinkably miniaturized contraction of authority, um, and yet the fate of our planet and our civilization depends on this arrangement. What remains to be seen is whether the people of our own country, and indeed the people of Earth, uh, will permit these weapons and these arrangements for presidential first use to remain in place. And then there is a second key question. If the people of this country do not wish these arrangements to remain in place, are there legal and constitutional tools that can help dismantle those arrangements? As we go through the day today, it will be helpful to keep in mind that the nuclear architecture is, of course, a physical architecture, but it is simultaneously a mental architecture, or more precisely, the mental architecture helps keep the physical architecture in place. So let me say a word about each, even though I'm talking to many of you who know all this already. Um, first, the physical architecture. It can be at least briefly glimpsed here, and though we might study this chart for uh, a, a long time, I, I'll just say two things about it. First, you can quickly see that 93% of uh, all of the world's weapons are possessed by the United States and Russia. So the United States is everything that sweeps from about 7 o'clock to 3 o'clock, and Russia, the big swath 
of weapons on the top. The different colors just indicate whether they're land-based, sea-based, or air-delivered missiles. Uh, North Korea, just for example, has um, 20 or fewer fissile material for 20 or fewer warheads. Some estimates actually place it as high as 60 warheads, but the most reliable estimates, uh, mainly by Hans Christensen um, at the Federation of American Scientists, still thinks that 20 or fewer is probably the accurate number, although we may hear from uh, various experts speaking today different accounts of this. Um, the other thing to realize is that, that each icon represents five missiles. First of all, can you hear me? Most of you, can you hear me? Yes. Each icon represents five missiles. So if you want to have a sense of the scale of our current arsenal, you need to actually um, multiply this out five times. Um, and that seems like a difficult task, but it's made a little bit easier for us by the fact that the New York Times, which has become newly attentive to the US arsenal, in the past it's been more attentive to other people's arsenal. The New York Times, about a week ago, you probably saw this, contemplated what portion of the US arsenal uh, was needed to decimate, that's the word they use, to decimate um, Libya, what portion was needed to decimate North Korea, what portion to decimate Syria, Iraq, Iran, China, and Russia, all these countries, and then showed how many of our weapons would be left over, and this is how many would be left over. These, and these, and these, and these, and these. Oh, a very helpful graphic for giving us a, a, a sense of the scale of this arsenal, even though it's clearly been reduced over the decades, but it's still uh, spectacularly out of, out of proportion. Um, now, as you know, it takes thousands of painstaking tests to put a physical arsenal um, into place. Thousands of steps. And 99.9% .9 of those steps have been taken. The arsenal is ready to go. It only needs the last step of a launch. So if one is thinking about the start gate, the start gate is not uh, the moment uh, when a, a president initiates a launch, um, although that's a crucial, obviously, place, and we'll be hearing from Bruce Blair and others about that. Um, if the, the, we're, we're already in the midst of it. We're already very late. That's why the bullet of atomic scientist puts the clock at two and a half minutes to midnight. Um, we're very, very late in this. Um, and it's also important to know, not, perhaps not everybody here realizes, that the missiles, the, the warheads are already assigned to specific targets, to specific cities all over the world. It's not an abstraction where they say we need five to go here or something. It's this specific missile is assigned to this specific city and so forth. And again, we find out about the numerical abundance. Um, and one instance of this uh, came about during the recent Bush administration when Cheney decided to ask how many of our missiles are assigned to any one city, and he took the example of Kiev. Tell me, I said to the planners, how many warheads are going to take Kiev under the current plan? It was a difficult question to get an answer to because I don't think anybody had ever asked it before. But I finally got a report back that under the current targeting plan, we had literally dozens of warheads targeted on this single city. Until the Clinton administration, the longitude and latitude of cities were programmed into the missiles. The longitude and latitude of specific cities were programmed into, for example, the missiles that are loaded onto the Ohio class submarines before they went out to port. Um, often the commanders didn't even know what cities were in those longitude and latitudes, but um, the decision had been made. Now, during the Clinton administration, this was changed to open ocean targeting. Uh, the longitude and latitude of remote places of the ocean that are uninhabited, uh, it was their longitude and latitude that was programmed into the missiles. Um, why was that done? Was it done because the whole citizenry in the United States demanded it? 
No, it was done because it was a fear that hackers, a very real fear, that hackers could get into the system and launch um, a weapon. Um, and, uh, and we have to be grateful, much as none of us like hackers, uh, that, that at least that change was made. But here's something that's crucial. That change did not mean that specific missiles and warheads ceased to be specifically assigned to cities. That practice continued. Uh, the open ocean targeting um, continued, that which began in 1994, continued uh, during President Obama's um, administration. And um, I'm not sure if it is still in place today. So what about the mental architecture that has kept this in place? Well, one key feature of the mental architecture is that very little information is given to the citizenry. And that attempts of the citizenry to protest can therefore be silenced by pointing out that they are speaking without any knowledge or information. Um, the black out of information imperils citizenship in the same way that in earlier centuries, pe people being deprived of the art of reading and writing imperils citizenship. It has acted as a firm piece of social control. So that's something important to hold on to because if you're trying to ever speak out about weapons and you feel, I'm incompetent, I don't have the knowledge, that if, if we're telling people have to speak with half knowledge, quarter knowledge, under knowledge, that is what has to be done and not be silenced by the um, double blackmail of having information withheld and then being faulted for not having information. Many, just as an example of misinformation, as you probably know, many people in the United States believe that our nuclear arsenal is only used to retaliate. Not that that's an only, but that it would never dream of first use, whereas we know it has a robust first use um, position. And it's also the case that many people in the United States believe that the only time a president has contemplated using these after Hiroshima and Nagasaki is during the Cuban Missile Crisis. But in fact, Eisenhower contemplated very seriously using an atomic weapon in the 1954 Taiwan Straits crisis, and again in 1959 in Berlin. Um, Kennedy, if you listen to the McNamara clip that was on the screen, Kennedy said three times he came within a hairbreadth, hairbreadth is his word, of all out uh, war with Russia. Lyndon Johnson contemplated using a nuclear weapon uh, against China to prevent China from getting a, uh, a, a nuclear weapon. And um, Nixon said that he four times contemplated it. Um, and that, that idea of contemplation may sound very remote, but in some cases it, it means actually sending out, uh, in Nixon's case, 18 planes filled with nuclear weapons to just run a circuit. Um, of, into the region that he was uh, tracking at that moment. Our current president, for many of us in this room and for many people around the world, um, is looked on as particularly reckless. And that's crucial to be aware of and to um, address. Yet the presidential first use structure is catastrophic even in the hands of the best of men. Yes, it's wildly dangerous if someone is reckless and irrational, but it continues to be fatal, even in the hands of those who are nominally racial, rational, because the architecture itself is so profoundly unrational, allowing or requiring, actually, that it's built to require that a small number of people launch this um, devastating um, scale of injury. A great silencer to questions or complaints has been deterrence, an incoherent doctrine whereby nuclear war is best prevented by having nuclear weapons rather than by not having nuclear weapons. Um, and we'll hear a more a, a kind of complicated interrogation of this from Cicel Hawk and others, uh, but I just want to say that many people in the heart of the military have now said that this is an incoherent doctrine. One of them, and again, you might have heard the clip that was playing, is General Lee Butler, who was Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Strategic Command, and who for a long time said he served the whole idea of deterrence, and then realized that it was a ghastly mistake. Deterrence, he said, is something that the nuclear priesthood extolled its virtues and bowed to its demands. Appropriated from the lexicon of conventional warfare, 
This simple prescription for adequate military preparation that is appropriated from conventional warfare where it made sense and where it had a very modest use, thus became in the nuclear age a formula for unmitigated catastrophe. It was premised on litany of unwarranted assumptions, unprovable <coughs> assertions, and logical contradictions. Now, a third feature of this mental architecture is the belief that nuclear weapons cannot be unmade. Um, nothing could be further from the truth. Assurance that they can be unmade comes from many different quarters. Um, one of them is the Southern Hemisphere, which is blanketed by um, nuclear weapons free zones. The Treaty of Kirlandaba, the Treaty of uh, Rarotonga, the Treaty of Tadaloga, the Treaty of Bangkok, and others. In fact, the nuclear problem is very much a north-south problem. The countries in red are the nuclear states, and the countries in blue are the nuclear weapons free zone states. And the international ban that is now gaining ratification um, is adding more and more countries to the, uh, those who will stand against the uh, possession of uh, nuclear weapons. But we have other evidence of how easily they're unmade. One is a study that was made in Scotland uh, during a recent referendum on Scottish uh, stubborns from UK, uh, which was motivated in part by Scotland's desire to get the uh, UK's nuclear submarines out of the Clyde River. Um, studies were done to show what the timetable would be. And John Hansley, the author, showed that some parts of it could be done in hours, dismantling the nuclear triggers. Um, some parts of it would take weeks, some parts of it would take months, but the whole thing could be done in between two and four years. Now, for the UK to eliminate its arsenal is not as much shorter than the United States, since it only has four Trident submarines and no air-based or land-based missiles. Uh, so it would take longer for us, but it is eminently doable. Um, and in fact, it, uh, it, it compared, for example, to the, um, to the, the problem of uh, global warming, the steps for dismantling nuclear weapons are straightforward and eminently doable. The question that we're asking today may seem to some of you a narrow question. Some people have said that to me. Um, it is, I believe, a, 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 a question whose answer is very deep and profound, because I believe that it has the capacity to directly address the, the very heart of what the nuclear arsenal is, and that many things follow from it if it turns out that presidential first use um, or authorization by a tiny number of people is um, completely illegitimate. So now, uh, just take a moment to uh, thank the many people who should be thanked, which begins with our wonderful speakers, who are as generous and kind as they are dazzlingly uh, intellectually knowledgeable, and who have uh, very quickly said yes to our invitation to speak, uh, not because they want to be here at 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning, but because this issue is something I think everyone recognizes as so important. Um, I'm also grateful to all of you in the audience um, for, for coming. And there are many of you in the audience who aren't speakers who have um, special expertise in this and uh, can help us. Owen Fisk is uh, always available to help any uh, Problem that needs constitutional repair. Um, Megan Rice, with two colleagues, broke into Oak Ridge, Tennessee uh, nuclear facility and broke through five perimeter fences. And uh, <laughs> protested the weapons and also, incidentally, made a little bit people aware of how weak the security was. Um, but I also want to thank. Uh, the people who have sponsored us um, because a conference like this takes a lot of resources. So the Harvard University Mahindra Humanities Center uh, and the directors, Homi Baba and Steve Beal and people there, Sarah Razor and Neil Akasuka, were just wonderfully generous in stepping forward and uh, saying yes to this conference. Harvard's Office of the Dean in Arts and Humanities, Robin Kelsey, and um, his assistant, Matilda von Est, were similarly uh, 
affirmative within a day or two of asking and have been uh, very, very generous. And financial help has also come from um, the Massachusetts Peace Action Education Fund, the Institute for People's Engagement, and the Union of Concerned Scientists. We also want to thank co-sponsors who have given a lot of support by making their participants aware of the conference. For example, Boston Review readership was made aware of the conference uh, without charging us for ads. The American Friends Service Committee, Council for a Livable World, Future of Life Institute, World Beyond War, Peace Action, Pops Christi, Massachusetts, Greater Boston, Physicians for Social Responsibility, Global Zero Boston, Women's Action for New Directions, and United for Peace and Justice. And then we also want to thank those of you who made a contribution, uh, which will considerably shorten the time that Jonathan and I spend in Debbie's prison, although we still, we will still be spending some time here. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, the list of, of people who are, many of whom are here in the audience, uh, are, are thanked. There's just a couple of uh, practical details. If you don't like going up and down these steps, if you go out this door and follow the path around to the right, you'll come to an elevator which will take you up. Um, at lunchtime, we just have uh, an, an hour of uh, lunch and we want to be back in the room. Senator Markey will be making remarks right at 1.45. We are providing a lunch um, for all of you who registered. Um, and the, uh, in, if you're up on that level, eating your box lunch, you're also going to have to take either the stairs or the elevator down to the, the floor below to use the restrooms. Um, by the way, there are food trucks. Uh, they're not free, but they're delicious. Uh, out, out in front of the Science Center, if, you, if the modest box lunch we're providing uh, is not to your taste. And there are no doubt other questions of practical housekeeping. Uh, but we'll answer them as we go along. So now we'll turn.